had a day yesterday that was so bad, right? That I finally just had to, like, I talked to Tori and I said, it is, it is statistically impossible for this many things to go wrong in one day. Like, it, you couldn't, you know, if you had to put odds on it, it would just be impossible odds. And I said, finally, I just told her, I said, this has to be some sort of spiritual attack. And um, I know that as bad as my day was yesterday, I know firsthand that there are some people in here right now who had worse days and worse weeks than I did. And I actually wasn't, um, I wasn't supposed to um, preach today. I, I had reached out to Pastor Jack kind of last minute and, um, and asked if he could preach for me today because I had a lot of stuff going on this week and had the annual business meeting. And he said, yeah, I can do that for you. And I got a, I got a call um, yesterday evening from Pam, his wife, Pam, if you don't know that. And, um, and she said, Jack will not be able to preach for you. He started having problems with his esophagus and had to be taken to the hospital. They had to do some emergency surgery on him. And then, um, and then after he came out of surgery, which went well, they found out that he had low oxygen levels and that he has pneumonia. So um, I thought I had a bad day yesterday. <laughs> so um, it just got me to thinking about, though, what's happening right now. And I hope we can receive this word today the way that it's intended, is that um, there is some spiritual attack happening. And sometimes we're so careful these days not to come across as being over-spiritual or, you know, seeing demons around every corner or whatever, you know, we don't want to seem like that. But we are kidding ourselves if we deny the reality that we have an enemy of our souls who is taking every opportunity he can to try and destroy us, right? So um, it made me kind of step back and look at um, something today that we had already passed by in the book of Exodus. So... I want to back up to the point when um, we, we covered it a few weeks ago, but when Pharaoh had gotten a little paranoid about the size of Israel in Exodus. We're going to be in Exodus um, for sure today as we've been, but we're going to back up a little bit to chapter two if you want to turn in your Bibles there. So he gets a little paranoid about the size of Israel and he decides to oppress them and use them as slaves to keep them from rising up against Egypt. Now, um, let's real quick, before we read this passage, address the purpose of attack. Because here's a truth to remember when the enemy attacks you. First and foremost, he can't win. He cannot win. And the second thing to remember is that he does not know the whole story. Um, oppression was coming at Israel, for sure. But God allowed it to happen. And if God is allowing it to happen, he's going to use that attack for his purpose and for their good. That's the reality of it. Sometimes in the moment, it's not that pleasant to hear. I think it's, I think it's one, of the, <laughs> one of the most often misused scriptures that when somebody is right in the throes of experiencing some kind of severe loss 
or, you know, just going through a tragedy and it's fresh and a Christian walks up to him and just remember God's working this for your good, right? Probably too soon for that verse. You know, it's probably a little bit soon for it. What people need during that time is they need compassion. They need love. They need mercy. They need prayer. They need you to be with them in that. That being said, even though it might be too soon to hit somebody with that verse, it is true. It is true that God is going to use all of this for his good and for his glory. And the end result of it will be good if we allow it to be that, right? If we don't stand in the way of what God is doing. So um, sometimes... In Israel's case, particularly, but I think in ours too, it's hard to step into what's next when you're too comfortable where you're at. God brought Israel to Egypt through the life of Joseph to provide for a season. But after a few hundred years, they were just content there. The provision had spawned complacency, and that complacency can be hard to break, right? Point of it is this. Sometimes when you're going through something that is hard, as soon as you can, right, when you can go, God, what are you speaking to me in this time? God, where do you need me to move during this time? God, what is your will in what's happening in this place? Because sometimes we won't move unless things get a little bit hard. Complacency like that can be hard to break. And remember, if there's no oppression, they never would have moved on to the promise that God had for them. And it was a difficult battle to get there. I had a, I had a guy tell me one time, he, he sat me down when I was young, I think I was about 21 years old. And he said, you know, Chris, sometimes, you know, if you, if you look at like an eagle's nest, right? Sometimes the, the baby eagles, the youngling eagles, they don't want to leave the nest. And, and the mama eagle, I'm sure I'm not using good scientific terms here, right? The whatever you call mama eagles. She'll get in that nest and she'll start thrashing around, just flapping her wings and making it very uncomfortable. Right? And finally, those eagles, those little eaglets, will flop out of the nest and have to take off flying, right? If, if she doesn't get in there and do that, they're never going to take off on their own and learn how to fly and fend for themselves. Now, I learned that lesson. I, I heard that story in the midst of a very bad day, right? When I learned that at 21 years old, as he sat me down in his office and told me that, I was in a place called where eagles soar, thus the very apt, you know, um, allegorical type metaphor that he used for me right then. But that was a Christian drug rehabilitation program. And I was about seven months into it. And I was at this place in life where I had accepted Jesus, and I just wanted to do everything so well. Like, I had done everything so bad for so long. Now it was like everything I did, I wanted to, like, if if you could get a grade on it, I was always shooting for the highest grade. I was just, you know, honestly, I was probably super obnoxious during that season of life, right? I just wanted to do everything the best, you know? So... I had gotten to this place in the program where um, I had a 
full-time job and, and was participating in different ministries and worship ministries. And I had met Tori during that time and they were allowing me to apply for passes and take Tori out on a date once in a while. So I applied for a pass to take Tori out to a revival meeting. And, um, you know, that's where Christians date. You go out to revival meetings, I guess, you know. I didn't know what to do. So it's like, hey, you want to go to a revival meeting? Sure. It's like, okay, I'll pick you up, you know. So it was a very, a very specific pass. I could pick her up, take her here, and then be home by 8.30 or whatever it was, Right. So we get out of the meeting, everything's going great, go out to my truck, it won't start. Now I know that's the classic dating thing, oh, my truck broke down. No, when it's at a revival meeting, no, it's true, your truck did actually break down. Long story short, I get home about an hour and a half late, past the pass, have to call somebody, get a ride, figure out how to get my truck, all this stuff, I get home an hour and a half late very strict policy. I got kicked out over that. And that was the conversation. It didn't seem fair to me. It didn't seem anything to me. I, I couldn't understand why there wasn't any leeway on something like that. But the message was this, Chris, we're thrashing around in the nest and kicking you out over the side. And it's like, okay. I, you know, in the moment, it felt so humiliating where I thought, I've got to go tell my family that I just got kicked out of here. You know, I'm trying to rebuild trust and all this stuff, and I was like, I got kicked out of rehab, right? God used that time for his glory, right? And I can't tell you all the different ways that God met me in that situation. I was comfortable where I was at, but it was time to move on. I can also share with you one of the best things that ever happened to me was also one of the hardest events in life when I lost my job about, I don't know how many years ago now, a long time ago. And, you know, it was this type of job where they don't come along all the time. And yet I knew I had a calling for many years to be in full-time ministry. But the job that I had wasn't something that I could necessarily walk away from. I couldn't just pull the string on that and say, I'm out of here. I'm going to go do this and, you know, with a wife and four kids. And it's like, no, I think I'll keep that job and we'll see what happens, right? And then without any warning, in a, in a moment, that job was gone, right? And it's like, okay, God, I guess now it's time to make that transition, right? So... Um, God will allow us to be put into difficult places and even be uncomfortable for a season because there's a work he wants to do. And in Israel's case, we see it's like if they hadn't gotten to that spot, they never would have gotten to what God had promised them. And I just want to encourage you, if you're in a tough place today, I believe this for myself. I believe it for this church. I believe it for what people are going through individually. I believe God has some promises for you that you're going to be able to enter into in this season. Now, with those attacks, there's always a deliverance. So... We know in Israel's case that the oppression created the desire for deliverance. So now it's time for God to raise up a deliverer. Aren't you glad that he does that for us? So in Exodus chapter 2, starting in verse 1, it says, And a man of the house of Levi went and took as wife, a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him and daubed it with asphalt and pitch. 
and put the child in it and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river and her maidens walked along the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call a nurse for you from the, <clears throat> from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother, and then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, because I drew him out of the water. So I believe that our enemy, and I don't necessarily always know how, but I believe that our enemy, the devil by name, has a sense of when God is going to do something great. I don't know how many times I've seen or felt or experienced everything going wrong, only to have God immediately follow that by something that was just extra awesome, right? Yeah. But there is something about that. I don't know how he does it. I know he doesn't know the specifics, but he knows something good is happening and the attack comes. The enemy may know something's coming, but he never gets the details right. That's something to remember about Satan, and that's this. He's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. And he's definitely not omnipotent, right? And he's definitely not even omnipresent. So he never gets the, de the details right. God was raising up a deliverer in Moses. The enemy didn't know who he was, so there was an attempt to just try to kill every male child. You see what I'm saying? He doesn't, he knows something good is about to happen. The attack comes, but he doesn't know the details. And then he never knows fully what God is going to do. God sent his only begotten son to be born in Bethlehem. The enemy knew this would be his defeat, so he tried to kill every male child. Doesn't have the details, but he just starts attacking, right? That's how I feel like those attacks come sometimes. It's like just the attack starts barraging you, and it's like, what's going on? Well, God's about to do something good. I don't think Satan knew exactly how God was going to use a shepherd boy like David, but he sure did try to kill him through King Saul, right? There's always this attack that comes when God's going to do something awesome. Everyone in this room has been attacked by an enemy who is afraid to see God's plan for your life fulfilled because he knew it would mean greater victories for God and greater losses for him. We've all experienced those sorts of attacks. You may have been attacked in your health. You may have been attacked in your relationships. Hey, speaking of attacks in your health, can I just share um, one more story with you? And then I'll move on because it's kind of, I'll, I'll be sure to have us out of here in time, but um, this was a pretty cool experience that I had this last week at district conference. So we show up for this prayer and worship time at like 9 a.m. Really cool, powerful time of worship. I don't know how many people were in the room right then, maybe three or 400 people were in the room. And they just, they just start worshiping, and then somebody will come up and pray, and then worship, full worship team, big church, really cool there. And, um, and you can just go wherever and pray if you want. You can find a spot to pray. You can do whatever. So about four years ago, 
I started having this problem with my throat, right? And, um, you know, I'd do this popping thing, and I could feel it in there, and I was worried about it. So I went, and they did, like, an ultrasound on me. They said, there's nothing there, you know? So it's like, okay. Another few months goes by, four or five months. It's still there. It feels a little stronger, stuff like that. I go, this is a problem, you know? So I go back. They do another ultrasound. Then they knock me out and do this uh, endoscopy and run cameras and do all this stuff. And, and they just say, there's nothing. There's nothing wrong with you. Fine, right? So for like the last four years, I've been dealing with that. It gets stronger and stronger. And sometimes I have problems sleeping and all this stuff. And you know how things just kind of play on your mind sometimes? And I finally just got into the place with it. They can't find it or whatever. I was just like, you know what, sometime, and I never even talked to Tori about this, but in my mind, I was like, sometime they're just going to realize that this is some kind of horrible thing that's going to kill me. It's out of control, and I'm done for, right? <laughs> like, that's how the mind works, you know? So really, weighing on my mind, but never sharing it with people. So in that time of prayer, I'm in the very back corner of this sanctuary, and I'm just kneeled down at a chair like one of these, and I just prayed, God, I'm done with this. I said, if it's your will that, um, that I just, you know, this is it for me and it's going to take me out or whatever, I don't care anymore. I'm surrendered to your will, God. I'm good with it. I know you'll provide for my family. I know you'll make a way. I'm done thinking about it. It's all good. I get up from that place of prayer. I go back. We're worshiping. Uh, one of the pastors gets up front, and he says, hey, I just got this word about somebody's health. And he shared this story about when he experienced that same thought mentally, where he had just kind of accepted it and all this stuff, and God had a word for him. But he said, I have a word for somebody in here who had kind of accepted this fact about dying. And he says, here's what God says to you. You're not going to die you're going to live, right? Now, I don't know how many other pastors were praying what I was praying on the floor there, but I was like, uh, that word was for me in this place, right? So as I said, you may have been attacked in your health. You may have been attacked in your relationships. You may have even been attacked through your loved ones. And you may even be under an attack right now. But what the enemy doesn't realize is that he is most likely being used by God Almighty to move us closer to the promises. When you're under the attack, the most extreme attack, you're close. Now, um, <clears throat> Moses was drawn out, and I want to deal with this real quickly in the time that I have left here. God has drawn you out of the waters of this world for a reason, and that reason has been known for an eternity. Before you were even formed in the womb, God knew you and called you. God has a purpose on each and every life in this place. God has known you and called you by name. God knew every attack that would be brought against you, and for every attack, God is providing an ark of escape. God always makes a way of escape. Now, here's something interesting about these vehicles of escape that sometimes are literal arcs, right? Like in Moses' case, or sometimes it's figurative. But here's something interesting about the arcs. Um, the structure of how they're built is important. Like with Moses, it was, it was woven together out of bulrushes and, and you know, carefully made, and there was even a little covering for it and all that. But without the pitch, without the, the ceiling of it, there's no way that that thing floats, right? Like if you just weave together a boat out of sticks and stick it in the water, it's just going to fill with water immediately and sink to the bottom, right? 
So the structure is important, but putting the pitch inside and out of it, that's what seals it, the tar and stuff, and makes it able to keep the water out, right, so that the ark will float. Even with Noah's ark in Genesis chapter 6, verse 14, it says, make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make the rooms in the ark, but then it says, cover it inside and outside with pitch. If he had skipped that step, the flood waters would have came and the ark would have just filled with water and all the animals inside and Noah and his family, right? So um, the pitch is the critical part of it. The word that is used for cover there with the ark, cover it with pitch. 71 other places that same word is used in the Old Testament but every other time in the Old Testament, it's translated atonement. It's in the context of the blood sacrifice and the blood being applied to our lives and that atonement for sins. One place translated, they pitched it, they covered the ark to keep out those waters. Everywhere else, it's atonement. You need to know whatever you're experiencing right now, whatever the attack may be or the hardship may be or has been, maybe you're in a good place right now, but you can relate to this in the past. Whatever you're going through or have gone through, you have been sealed by the blood of Jesus. We talk about looking to the cross and looking to the cross is good but it's the blood that was spilled on the cross that seals us. You have been sealed and covered by the precious blood of Jesus. We lose sight of all that and fall into despair sometimes when we're under an attack, but we should have faith that we have been sealed by the blood and we will not sink in this storm of an attack that we're in. No weapon formed against you will prosper or reach the intended end of destroying you. It's amazing how Pharaoh was afraid of Israel's rebellion, but he ended up raising it up, the deliverer, the source of this rebellion, in his own home. And it just makes you ask, like, is there anything God can't do? He ended up raising, like paying for his upbringing. He ended up raising what he was trying to destroy when he was trying to destroy all the male children. He actually paid vicariously through his daughter. He paid Moses' own mother to take care of him. It's what God can do. The place where Pharaoh's daughter was bathing in the Nile when she found Moses, it wasn't just like the royal bathtub for them, right? It was actually a place of pagan ceremonial cleansing in their religion. Again, God used Pharaoh's own demonic religion as a point of infiltration for his kingdom plan. There's nothing that God can't do. There's more than hope when you're under an attack. God has prepared a table for us in the presence of our enemies. I was thinking about what Joseph said and to his brothers, but I I think we can all say this as well, it says, what was meant for evil against me, God meant for good. Yeah. <laughs> now, here's what's cool about that. Here's the enemy, here's his attack, but he doesn't even get to define what the purpose of his attack is. He may have been intending evil the whole time, it's like, well, yeah, 
We understand enemy. We understand devil. We understand whatever it is that's coming against us and attack us. You're trying to destroy. That's what you intended. You don't get to define the purpose of your attack because God is intending it to bring good, right? I love that. I love that the enemy doesn't even get to tell us what it's for. It's God who defines what it was meant for, and he is. And sometimes, like I said, this is hard to accept when you're in the middle of it, when you're in the throes of it, right? But he will work all things together for our good. Amen? Now, um, I'm going to... I'm going to ask you a question, but um, I want to give you a heads up and not trick you here, right, and kind of dupe you into something, because know this, if you respond yes to this and raise your hand, I'm going to have the people around you pray for you, okay? So fair warning, if you don't want that for some reason, keep your hand down, right? (laughs) Hand goes up, you're getting prayer. That's the way it's going to work today. But if you feel like you've been under some kind of attack right now, and it's been hard, like even in the midst of this, it's been hard to see, God, I know you're good. I know something good is on the way, but I don't know what it looks like. I don't know when it's going to happen. It feels like I'm drowning in this right now. If you felt like you're under some kind of attack right now, physically, in your family, in your finances, whatever it is, and you could use help from the Lord. There is no pressure from me right now to raise your hand, right? But if you want prayer, go ahead and slip your hand up. Now, keep them up for just a second. I want the rest of us to look around at whose hands are up in the air and find somebody to pray for, amen? So let's do it, church. Let's gather around our church family. Let's lift them up in prayer. Keep your hand up until somebody gets to you to pray for you. Yes, Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Lord, we lift up Pastor Jack to you, God. We lift up Pastor Jack as he's dealing with some physical challenges right now, God. We pray, Lord, that you would bring healing to his lungs, Lord, healing to his esophagus, Jesus, and that you would restore him, Lord. Even now as he's at this hospital, Jesus, we pray for a mighty touch from heaven. Lord, we lift Larry Banks before you, Jesus. As he's had this stroke, Lord, and he's in a hospital over in Reno, Jesus, we pray, God, that you would restore the movement to the right side of his body, Lord, and that you would bring healing to him, Jesus. We believe, Lord, that you are our savior, our baptizer, our healer, and our soon coming king. So, Lord, we just bring these situations before you, Lord, and ask for healing, Jesus, in your mighty name. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. God, thank you for being our deliverer, Lord. Thank you for having a a way of escape prepared for us in every attack, Lord, in every hardship. We thank you for this, Jesus. We thank you for this, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You don't have to you don't have to stop praying if you're still praying with somebody but church we serve a great God amen 
We serve a great God. He is faithful and he's going to see us through whatever it is that we might be going through in this time for the people we know and love who are having a hard time dealing with some physical things. We're trusting God for him. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you.